Our first presenter is Klaus Van Velt. He's Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Wyoming. He got his academic degrees from the University of London and from the University of California, Berkeley. Aside from UW, he's taught at the University of Michigan. He's a winner at UW of the Crocker Young Scholar Award for his scholarship on economics and the environment. He publishes in venues like Journal of Environmental Economics. Um, Journal of Environmental Economics and Management, Resource and Energy Economics, Energy Journal, the International Review of Law and Economy. As he told me yesterday, if an issue connects the economy and the environment, he's working on it. Issues like oil, climate change, eco-labels. This morning, Klaus is giving us a talk called, I love this title, Give Me Austerity and Fiscal Discipline, But Not Yet. <laughs> Please welcome Klaus Van Velt. Thank you. Um, I'm the kind of prof that usually hides behind the lectern, but Amy told me I might be more amazing if I try to walk around, so I, I'm gonna <laughs> I might halfway hide again. So, um, like Peter said, the, talk of my, the title of my uh, talk is actually not mine. It, th this is Paul Flesher's. Um, <laughs> I had a really, really boring title. It, economists don't do funny, but then Paul Flesher saw it a little blurb that I had explaining the, the content. He said, oh, that, that reminds me of St. Augustine's famous prayer, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> because at the time that he was praying, he was still young and he still wanted to frolic a little bit. And so that's, the, that's how I came up with my title, give me austerity and fiscal discipline, but not yet, because right now we're still in a very deep economic slump. <coughs> now, I want to find out, first of all, just get a little bit of a sense of whether, uh, to what extent I'm preaching to the choir here. So I'd like to just, by show of hands, ask you two questions. The Obama administration, when it came in um, in 2008, passed a $787 billion federal, federal stimulus package, which has now long been spent. In your view, just from, from whatever you know, from reading the newspaper, watching the TV, whatever you know about the economy, do, would you say that the stimulus package has mostly helped the economy? has mostly had no effect or mostly hurt the economy. So who would choose A, mostly helped the economy? Who would say B, mostly had no effect? And who would say C, mostly hurt the economy? Okay, one more. Much more general now, zooming out. In general, in times of high unemployment, which we're still in very much right now, do you think the government should increase the deficit? Hold the deficit stable or cut the deficit? Who, sh who thinks it should increase the deficit in a time like now? Okay. Who says it should keep the deficit stable? And then who says it should cut the deficit? Okay. Good. So at least I, I don't have a whole lot of agree uh, agreement here. That's a good thing. Now, because <laughs> that, that gives me something to talk about. You, you might be under the impression. If, if you get your economic news mostly from the newspaper or from, or from TV, that economists can't agree on these things, right? That they're violently disagreeing about the answers to these questions. And, if, or, and even individual economists can't make up their mind. There's actually a famous quote by President Truman, give me an economist with one arm, because he just got so frustrated about economists saying, on the one hand this, but on the other hand that. <laughs> the reality, though, is that economists overwhelmingly agree about the correct answers to those two questions that I just showed you. Greg Mankiw is pro arguably one of the most influential economists right now. He was the ad uh, chief economic advisor to the first Bush Jr. Ad administration, 2003 to 2005. Um, he was advisor to the Mitt Romney campaign recently. He's a, the, the chair of the Harvard Economics Department right now. And he's also the author of what's, what I think is the most popular basic um, textbook for economics that's, that's used all over the country. Essentials of Economics is one of the versions of it. And in that textbook, he has this table here. And what it shows is 10 propositions and the percentages of economists who agree on the answer, to, uh, or agree on those propositions. And you can, let me just pick one out here. Number four, fiscal policy, for example, a tax cut and or a government expenditure increase. 
has a significant stimulative impact on a less than fully employed economy. 90% of economists agree on this. All over the, the, no matter what their politics, liberal to conservative, 90% of economists agree. Fiscal stimulus works in an, an unemployed economy. But then you go down and you see Proposition 7. A large federal budget deficit has an adverse effect on the economy. 83% of economists agree on that. So how does that work? Because increasing the deficit helps the economy, but a large deficit has an adverse effect on the economy. How can you believe both things at the same time? Well, 85% of economists agree on this statement. If the federal budget is to be balanced, it should be done over the business cycle, not year by year. And so what we all agree on is that government should when we're in an economic recession, like we are very much still right now, and probably will be for another four or five years, we should be running deficits. During economic booms, once the economy comes out of the recession and starts booming again, that's when the government should cut, hold back, raise taxes, cut spending, and pay, pay down its deficit, so run a surplus. In other words, it should balance its budget over the business cycle, not at any point, not at every point in time. And that's what I want to be talking about today. So that's my first take home message today. Now, I, this lecture that I'm giving you today, I, I give to um, my freshman class at, at UW every semester. And I notice always this is a very, very hard set of, set of ideas to get across. People just don't buy it. They just viscerally don't like to think that, uh, that this is true. And I think what the problem is, is the economy is very complicated, right? Macroeconomics is a, is a, a tough subject, although I'll, 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 I'll try to show you the basics of macroeconomics just in a few minutes uh, today. And when people try to make sense of it, what they do is they, rather than think about the whole complicated economy, they, they just use what they think they do understand, namely their own household, as an example of how the economy works. And clearly, at the level of a household, if you're running a deficit, right, you should cut spending. There's no question about it. And it's when you are booming, right? You've got, just got a big raise, that's when you start spending more. Right? Then you can afford to, to splurge a little bit. Or people think of it, maybe if they're business owners themselves, they think of the economy as a business. If, if a business is running a deficit, then of course it's not going to start spending more, right? It's going to cut back and it's going to fire some workers, try to get the, the, the the rot out of the system is a, a, a statement you sometimes hear. That makes perfect sense at the level of a, an individual firm. And conversely, if a business is doing great, right, that's when it can expand a little bit and hire a little bit more. And so again, that seems to just go against your, your gut sense of what, what should be right. And thirdly, I think people can't help when it comes to issues of money bringing their, their notions of morality in. Right? If you're doing badly, right, you've been a bad boy. You should punish yourself. And it's when you've been a good boy, then you can reward yourself. And this seems to be saying the exact opposite. And what I'm going to be trying to convince you of today, though, is that, and this is my take home message number two, when you're looking at the economy as a whole, right, not an individual household, not an individual firm, the economy as a whole is not like a household. In fact, almost exactly the opposite of a household. It's not like a corporation. It's almost exactly the opposite. And it's definitely not a morality play. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell, what I'm going to try to convince you of today. I think personally that if I would like this lecture that I'm giving you today, there, there should be a, a constitutional amendment that every US citizen should take my lecture and be <laughs> tested on it. And I think the country would be run a whole lot better if they did. It's just, or at least maybe politicians before they can stand for office. So, but the key word is as a whole, right? We're doing macroeconomics here. We're looking at the economy as a whole. Now, to, under, to explain what's underlying these statements, I need to introduce one key concept, which we, which we call the circular flow of the macroeconomy. That's what drives everything here. The economy basically is a collection of households and firms. Those are the major parts of the economy. I'm going to add a few parts later on. But let me start simple. Households send labor to firms. And in return, the firms using that labor make stuff, right, goods, and send those goods back to households. 
That's called the circular flow of the real economy. Where real just means stuff you can hold in your hands, right? Goods or sweat of your brow. That's the circular flow of the real economy. Corresponding to that is a circular flow of what we call the money economy. In return for the labor that households send to firms, firms send income to households. And households use that income to buy the firm's goods. And so money goes around the other direction. The circular flow of the real economy goes that way. The money economy goes this way. When you see the word GDP, that's just a measure of how fat that arrow is. So GDP can either be measured as how fat this arrow is, the income arrow, or how fat the expenditure arrow is. And if the book's balanced, they in fact should be equal. Now, you might admit, be thinking, well, but actually, I don't, I don't immediately spend all my income, at least not immediately, right? And yes, that's why we have to complicate this picture a little bit. Households don't spend all their income immediately. The, household also, the, the economy also has a financial sector, which I'm just going to call banks for short. And households send their savings, the part of their income that they don't immediately spend, to banks, right? And now, notice I'm, I'm starting to use a different color. I'm going to be color coding my graph here. From now on, blue arrows are going to represent what economists call injections into the circular flow. So that money that helps, that goes around, that helps the circular flow. And red arrows are going to be called leakages. Savings are a leakage. Just imagine if all, all citizens in the US suddenly decided to save all of their income, the economy would grind to a halt, right? Because all their money would go in the bank, and nobody would be spending anything on goods anymore. So the economy would grind to a halt. Savings are a leakage. They detract from the circular flow. Now, in normal times, banks don't just sit on those savings, luckily. So savings flow into banks, but banks then take those savings and use them to lend to businesses, right, for investment. And so that arrow, the investment arrow, is an injection into the economy. And in fact, in normal times, savings and investment are equal to each other. So the leakage from households to banks is offset by the investment um, injection from banks back into the economy. And then, of course, there's the government. The government taxes households, which is another leakage. Once again, right, if the government were to suddenly tax away all our incomes, the economy would grind to a halt because nobody would work anymore. So that's a leakage, but the government then turns around and uses those taxes to purchase things, highways, school buildings, etc. So government purchases are another injection. And then finally, we should think also about other countries as playing a role in the, in the macroeconomy. When we buy stuff from other countries, imports, that's a leakage because that's money that doesn't go to our own firms, right? So that's a leakage. <laughs> But when other countries buy stuff from us, exports, that's an injection because that's money that goes to our firms to make stuff again. But that's pretty much the picture of the macroeconomy, as simple as I can keep it. And again, GDP is either the sum of all incomes, so how fat this arrow is, or the sum of all injections, consumption, investment, government purchases, and then typically we, we calculate the, the export-import side as net imports, so meaning um, exports minus imports. And in fact, that's how GDP is measured. The government accountants, every year when they determine, or every month when they determine what GDP is, what they do is they calculate it both ways. They add up all the incomes, that's the income approach to measuring GDP, and they add up all the injections, that's the expenditure approach. Now here again is a, a really important fact to keep in mind as I go forward. The big gorilla here is consumption. That's what drives the economy. 70% of GDP comes from consumption. So what consumers decide to do drives the economy. Business investment is only about 15%. Government purchases, only 19. And these are averages, right? It bumps up and down a few percent um, depending on whether we're in the, what, where we're in the business cycle. And then this is a little screwy. Export and imports actually are measured negatively. That's how it adds up to 100. And that's because for, for many decades now, th uh, we've run a current account deficit, meaning we've, we've imported a little bit more than we export. But uh, that's only 5% the difference. 
So keep in mind, consumption is what drives all this. So back to our picture. Consumption is the big fat arrow here. I've, I've actually made the arrows in the picture kind of proportional to their actual importance in the economy, their size. Now, what is a recession? A recession happens when consumption contracts. That's how a, con a recession starts. And usually, so not notice the arrow shrieking, right? Usually that happens because of something like a financial crisis, right? The mortgage crisis, the savings and loans crisis, the dot-com bubble. There's a financial crisis and, and consumers freak out. Think of it that way. They just go, so I, I thought I was doing well, I thought I was, I, I, I was secure in my job, but now suddenly the world has changed on me. And consumers start holding back. They start worrying. Something, something major went wrong in the economy. Now, if consumers stop buying stuff, Investment shrinks as well, right? If, if consumers, if this, the, the, your goods aren't flying off your shelves, you're not going to be investing in a new machine or a new factory or a new store. And so investment typically responds by shrinking as well. Notice it's harder to see, but the arrow gets skinnier here too, right? And if the recession is worldwide, like the one we're in right now, Typically, exports will shrink too, right? Other countries will also be in a recession, so they won't be buying our goods as much. So the export arrow shrinks here. But now comes the rub. If people aren't buying goods, firms can't just be sending the same amount of money to households, right? They're not getting as much money coming in. People aren't buying their stuff. And so what firms have to do is start firing people. And when they fire people, incomes shrink as well. Now what happens when incomes shrink? Consumers get even more worried, right? I saw a, a survey just yesterday saying that I think something in the order of three quarters of Americans at least know somebody who's lost a job or has been out of work for a while during the recession. So when you see that happening around you, even if you still have your own job, you're gonna hold back. You're gonna be less, less happy to buy that new car or that new washing machine. And so what typically happens is as the, economist, as the income shrink, Consumption shrinks even more, what should get even skinnier. And when consumption shrinks even more, investment goes down again further, and maybe exports go down even further, resulting in more layoffs and therefore even lower income. And so what we have is a vicious cycle, right? Consumption shrinking causes investment and exports to shrink, causes incomes to shrink, causes even more shrinking, and that just goes on and on and on, and we have a, ourselves a deep economic recession. What do you think happens to leakages? For example, taxes, what do you think happens? Anyone want to volunteer? What do you think happens in a recession like this to the, the leakage of taxes here? Smaller, because a lot of people are out of jobs, and so typically tax revenues plummet. Very skinny. What about savings? Oh, imports eventually too, right? Again, if we're in a worldwide, well, no, imports means that's us buying from abroad, right? If we feel poor, we're not gonna be buying as many imports either, so imports shrink. But what about savings? They actually could go either way, right? The recession starts because consumers want to save more, right? They freak out. They don't wanna spend as much, they wanna save for a rainy day. So you'd think savings would go up, but once the recession kicks in, their incomes are lower, and so they actually are less able to save. And so savings actually could go either way. This is what economists call the, the paradox of thrift. Recessions happen because people want to be more thrifty, but because they want to be more thrifty, they end up being less able to be thrifty. So that's the paradox of thrift. Generally, what happens though is savings, to the extent that people are still saving, they just pile up at banks un uninvested because banks don't have anybody who wants the savings to invest. And that's very much what's happening still right now. Now comes the trillion dollar question. What should the government do in this case? Let me give you a hint. Don't do what the Europeans have been doing. <laughs> what 90% of economists agree on is what the government should do in this situation is run a bigger deficit, because that's the only arrow that, it ha that can still provide an injection into the economy, right? Consumers are not consuming, 
If they're not consuming, businesses are not investing, we're not exporting, the only injection left is government purchases. And so government should up its purchases, provide an injection into the economy. In fact, run a bigger deficit the bigger the recession is. When it does that, that will put firms back to work, right? So if the government uses a recession, when by the way, typically interest rates are very low, right now they're, they're essentially zero, so it can borrow very cheaply to pay for, for stuff. When governments run big deficits to start repairing our infrastructure, or um, investing in new technologies, right? All the stuff that governments do, that will put firms back to work. That means firms can start paying households slightly higher incomes. That means households will hopefully feel a little bit more confident and start spending a little bit more again. That means that investment will go up again. Tax cuts may help too, right? It doesn't have to be government expenditure increasing. You could also cut taxes. But what do you, what do you think might be a problem when the government tries to stimulate the economy through tax cuts? If you understand what drives the, the recession in the first place. People might just say, well, great, I've got a tax cut, let me just save it, because I'm still really worried, right? The economy is still not back where it is at. And so you always have to worry that tax cuts tend, in a recession, just tend to get saved. And that then doesn't help, because that's just the same leakage again. If you keep this going, though, the vicious cycle will become a virtuous cycle. Consumption increases further. Investment then increases, too, because now businesses start selling stuff again. Exports may increase again. And then incomes increase until eventually we were back to normal. Now at that point when we're back to normal, right, we've got our fat arrows again, at that point the government can cut spending, raise taxes, and get back to budget balance. Now more likely than not, once we're back to normal, just wait, a lo wait a long enough and at some point consumers start getting overexcited. And so they'll start spending too much, a too fat arrow. And if there's not enough goods, consumers want to buy a lot of stuff, but there's not enough goods being produced, what do you get is inflation. They'll save too little, the, government, the economy will overheat, and that is a great time for the government to start putting the brakes on. And so that's when the government should cut spending, raise taxes, and generate a surplus to pay down the debt. And that's the first part of my story. Now, so government should run deficits during economic recessions, because that gets you out of the recession very quickly. <coughs> Surpluses during economic booms, that's when you pay down the debt that you incurred by running a deficit during the recession. That's what 90% of economists agree on. Now, oh, let me, before I show you that, oh, no, I already told you that story. So here's my take home message too, right? The economy as a whole is not like a household, not like a corporation, not a morality play. What I want to do in the rest of my talk is kind of tell the same story I just told you again, but in a slightly different way. Um, by telling you a story of, of a kind of weird household. A household that actually is very much like the economy as a whole. And in some respects is also like a, like a corporation. And I'm going to tell you the story in the form of a play. But the whole point is to, to and, and please listen for this as, you're going through this as I'm going through the story, I'm going to ask you at the end, how is this household different from a standard household? Or how is this household different from a regular firm? How is the play that I'm going to show you now different from a morality play? So let's go. Act one. Meet Mabel, Sally, and Bob. That's the household. Mabel, you can think of it as the mom of the household, likes to make stuff and manage Sally and Bob because this is an odd household. They make all their own stuff. Everything the household uses and eats and is all made by the household. Sally and Bob work for Mabel and Mabel hands them the goods that they use. She pays them wages, their monthly allowance, right? With Monopoly dollars. And Sally and Bob then use those Monopoly dollars to buy Mabel's goods. 
And so here we have the circular flow of the economy going on in this household. This little mark over here, pay attention to it because it, it's going to have a red cross through it if, if I'm adjusting the picture in a way that, may, that screws up the circular flow. This says the circular, here's the circular flow is perfectly happy, right? Incomes and expenditures are balanced. We've got a circular flow going on. The key rub here is that Sally and Bob are different. Sally is frugal. She's one of those kids that just loves to hoard their allowance, right, and have it, watch it pile up and, and feel really rich. So she doesn't spend very much. She's got a very skinny expenditure arrow here. She gets the same allowance as Bob, but doesn't spend it all. Bob, though, is one of those kids that can't wait until the day of their allowance. They want to spend it right away. So Bob is a spendthrift. His expenditure arrow is fat. And notice we don't have a circular flow here going on, right? Because Bob is spending wanting to spend more, at least, than he gets in income. What happens is Sally ends up saving. So that's the mnemonic here. Sally is the saver. And lending to Bob, who's the borrower. So she sends some of her income to Bob. And Bob, in return, sends her little pieces of paper saying, I'll, I'll pay you back. Here's an IOU. So think of Sally as basically the banking sector of the economy. right? And where does the banking sector get its money? From all the savers in the economy. And so Sally's kind of the banking sector and the saving consumers all together. This keeps going for a while. This is fine, right? We've got a circular flow going on. Everything is in balance. And Sally's just piling up her IOUs from Bob. <laughs> Everybody's thinking of their own sister or brother who's one of these, right? <laughs> but then at some point, Sally has what economists call a Minsky moment. This is after a famous economist called Hyman Minsky. Sally goes, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm never going to get repaid. And this is exactly what happened in 2007 with the mortgage crisis, right? Suddenly the financial sector realized, whoa, we've been, we've been lending to the Bobs, right? All the low subprime mortgages. And we thought those assets were safe, but we now realize we're never going to get repaid. Those assets weren't safe after all. That's what happened in 2007, a Minsky moment. So panicking, Sally stopped lending. That's what happened in 2007. Away is the lending flow. So the household has a financial crisis. And Bob has to cut back spending and start repaying salary. But we're still not in, in balance here, right? What's the problem here? Mabel is paying out big fat incomes and only getting very little expenditure because Bob has cut back on his expenditure. So stuff is not adding up. With Bob spending less, Mabel has to cut hiring. But if Mabel cuts hiring to match the lower expenditures he's getting in, Bob can't repay Sally. Now we're back in the circular flow. But look, we've got a very skinny expenditure arrow, very skinny income arrow. We've got a circular flow, but at a much skinnier level. So the household is in recession. Right? Bas basically, Sally and Bob are just sitting around most of the time not having any work and getting very low allowances. But we're in circular flow. This can go on for a long time. And if, if there's any questions afterwards, I can show you examples of where this kind of thing happened for 10 years, 15 years, 18 years in various countries in the world if they didn't intervene. They just sat in a recession and sat there pretty much forever. Eventually, and that's what you're going to have to wait for, Sally might start to spend a little bit more, maybe when she retires, right? Start thinking, well, maybe let me use some of my IOUs. So when she starts spending a little bit more, Mabel can hire a little bit more, right? Because now she's got a little bit more money coming in. And Bob can start repaying his debt a little bit more. Very skinny repayment arrow. So now the IOUs gradually get paid off. But that could still take a very long time. Is there a better solution? Act two. Enter Gus. 
Gus was actually there all along. I just left him out of the picture. <laughs> and what Gus was doing was collecting taxes from, from Sally and Bob, just a little fraction of their monthly allowance, and using that, so because of the taxes, they got to spend a little bit less in private goods, right? Their expenditure hours are a little bit skinnier. But he was using those taxes to, to spend on public goods. So stuff that the whole household used, right? The maintenance of the house, the sofa, the TV, all the stuff that everybody was using. So that's, what, that's Gus expenditure. And because his, his budget was balanced, that neither helped the economy nor hurt the economy. He was just there in the background all the time. This was just how they took care of the public expenditure in the house. But one day, because they're still in this deep recession, right, he proposes a new idea. What if I start spending a whole lot more big fat government expenditure, a Gus expenditure um, <laughs> arrow here, on all those things in our house that need repair, because the, the carpet is getting pretty ratty, right? That, that sofa, we really need a new one by now, right? What if I just start doing that? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll use this to build up our infrastructure, and you guys can go back to work. Or maybe I could spend not quite so much more and cut your taxes instead, but then you guys have to promise that you're going to use that money to, to spend for your, on your own private goods to keep Mabel, get Mabel back working again. So Mabel will then need to hire you full time again, right, to do all those repairs in the house. And then Bob can start repaying his debt faster. And now Sally pipes up. How are you going to pay for all that, Gus? By borrowing from you, Sally. <laughs> because, look, Sally's still not spending. She's still getting income that's greater than her expenditure. And so, she can send loans to Gus in return for Gus IOUs. Those are the blue ones here. So, Bob can pay his debt back much faster. Watch the red go down. And Sally's basically exchanging private debt for government debt, which is exactly what's been happening over the past five years. Sally just keeps buying G bonds, and Bob is working off his private debt. And once Bob is done repaying, he can start spending more again. Gus then can stop borrowing, cut spending, raise taxes, and the Gus budget is back in balance. This can go on for a long time. We're back in circular flow. But eventually, Sally will start increasing her spending. When she does that, Gus can cut spending further and use the Gus budget surplus, right? Now he's getting more taxes than he's spending to pay down the Gus debt. The end. Now, so here's my question, here's the test. How was this household, what's the important re way in which this household is very different from a regular household? Anyone? A regular household, right? If it got into trouble, like this household did, would lower spending. But this household, when it lowered spending, because of the circular flow, because we're looking at an economy as a whole, lower spending just means lower income when it comes around. And so lower spending just means a lower ability to repay. If you're a regular household, cutting spending means you have a higher ability to repay your debt to the outside bank, say, right? But if you're in a circular flow economy, lower spending just means a lower ability to repay. So everything is topsy-turvy once you start thinking of the economy as a whole. It's exactly the opposite of a regular household. How is this household different from a corporation losing money? Same deal, right? A corporation, when it loses money, lowers hiring. It cuts workers. That's how it gets back into the, the black. But because of the circular flow, if the economy as a whole lowers hiring, that just means lower sales when it comes around, right? If you don't hire as much, there's less income, people are not going to buy your stuff. And that means a lower ability to repay or to get back to profit. Again, topsy-turvy. At the level of the economy as a whole, the economy is exactly the opposite of a firm. 
which I keep wanting to tell politicians that have business experience and think that's going to help them be a better, better president. No. You learn, need to learn the exact opposite of what you learned as a businessman when you become a president because the economy as a whole is the exact opposite of a firm. And how is this play not a morality play? Both lenders and borrowers, Sally and Bob, were hurt, right, by the financial crisis, regardless of who, whose fault the crisis was. It's not a morality play. And you can argue, right, was, was Sally at fault for lending Bob, even though she should have known that he couldn't repay, right? Was the financial sector to blame for the subprime mortgages? Or do you blame the people that got the mortgages, even though they should have known that they, they weren't able to actually pay it? I don't know who's to blame. It doesn't matter. Right? Both of them will get hurt in a recession, and we should just try to get out of the recession as quickly as possible. And so don't approach this as a morality play. Just get back, get the economy back on its feet. And that really is the end. <laughs> Questions? Yes? One aspect of, at least one aspect of this circular flow that I'm struggling with is the, the concept, I guess, of value added government spending. In other words, if the government's actually spending money on goods and expanding the the flow of money back into the economy that way. That's one thing, but I guess the buzzword lately has been entitlement programs, the concept of spending money in a way that does not contribute back to that flow. If I missed something there, or is that a different aspect altogether? Yeah, that is a very different aspect. I mean, entitlement spending, the way I think of it is I, through my payroll taxes, right, save up money for my Social Security when I retire, or I save up for my Medicare, right? I, the government gets in taxes, payroll taxes, to pay for Medicare, Social Security, and at some point, I want it back. So the government is just, in addition to running the country, the government is just one big insurance company. And so entitlement spending is just the repaying what you put in. Now, the big problem is that actually the government is not getting in enough in, in payroll taxes relative to what it's spending. And that's the long-run problem we're facing in this country that we're not taxing people enough relative to what we pay out in Social Security and Medicare, that's something we will have to take care of because that's driving the long-run deficit picture. But that's basically very easy, to, very easy to solve in principle, right? Either raise payroll taxes to match Social Security and Medicare payments or lower Social Security and Medicare payments to match the taxes, either way. Unless the government is spending that money that was actually not invested by it, the organizations of the people that receive it. In other words, if I'm if I pay Social Security my whole life and I'm drawing it now, yeah, the government's like a bank. Mm -hmm. But what if what if that money is instead money that I never paid into Social Security, but I'm drawing it anyway? Well, right, that's that is what ha to some extent that's happening right now. So all people currently pulling in Social Security are getting more in than they ever paid into the system already right, right. now, and the same is true for Medicare. And so that is a problem. But that's a very se separate thing from goosing the economy or trying to get out of, that's just, the gov there's this story, and then there's the government being a bank and needing to, to make sure that it, or being an insurance company and needing to make sure that it gets enough in as premiums to be paying out its, its uh, Thank you. yeah. Yeah, right, right. And so th they're, because it's ultimately all driven by consumer confidence, right, anything that, that keeps consumers very uncertain about what's going on is going to lengthen the slump. And that's very much what's going on right now, right? There's a lot of uncertainty and fiscal cliffs and sequesters and debt ceilings. And, and so consumers for years now keep feeling, well, I, I still don't feel happy to start spending. And so th this, as long as that keeps going, it's... And, Fundamentally, it is about consumer sentiment, right? Which is very hard to predict. And so we can't say, well, if you just do this, it'll be over in five years. No, it could be six, could be seven. But that's what drives it. And the, the quicker you start the economy going again, the quicker you'll get out, and the quicker you'll be able to start pay, pay off your deficit. Okay. The, in regards to the morality issue and the housing bubble, mm -hmm. my understanding is 
the housing bubble was stimulated by the idea that government pushed to have more people buy their own homes. Okay? So for me, that's a moral stance saying everybody should be able to buy a home, whether they can afford it or not. And isn't that the basis of what happened? No. It's, it, it played a very small, you're talking about Fannie and Freddie Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a very small part of that. They, they actually, the whole housing bubble started well before they, be, they started getting into subprime mortgages. But it was, it was part of the story, yes. Okay. The, there was a policy saying we want people to have their own homes because then they feel invested. So and isn't, but I mean, even if that's a small part of it, isn't that a, a moral stance? Don't you see it as, as the government saying, morally, these people deserve a home? Rather than saying, economically, these people can afford a home and we should encourage them. And not if they can't afford a home. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. That, okay. but the, so it, it's morality in the sense that that is a political decision where you want to, right now, right now the big debate is, are we going to cut, for example, the mortgage deduction, right? Mm -hmm. We're in fact, re even now, that's one of the biggest, what we call tax expenditures. The government cuts your taxes, my taxes, I benefit from this every year, just because I own a home rather than a rent one. It. Is it sentimental or is it Oh no, it's thousands of dollars. Okay. It's one of the biggest expenditures out there. We could cut the deficit by a huge amount just by getting rid of the mortgage deduction okay. and the healthcare de the, the, the deduction. Those are the two big ones. And yeah, so, so yes, those are, politics is all about morality. But ultimately, it's about what we as a country feel is a good thing to do or not a good thing to do. That's that not what I'm talking about. The economists don't get into that. <laughs> That's right. We all vote in that in the back. What about the service side of the government increasing um, their, if you take them there and said they just go straight into the income side and the government expands the, the workforce instead of buying more goods? They yeah, I said goods, people. but really I should say goods and services. And so, yeah, the, your teachers, your firemen, your policemen, right? That's, that's also government expenditure, yeah. Because it keeps people in work, in jobs, right? The government uh, subsidized low-income housing, and it didn't improve anything. Uh, green, green in Chicago just was a complete failure. The people moved in, but Well, I'm not saying they should. I mean, it, there is a very big question, and we should all be very much involved in that, how it spends its money, right? And there's smart ways of doing it, and there's not so smart ways. But well, why did the banks offer you 125% uh, loan when, when they couldn't even pay a 70% loan? Right. Yeah, they, they had convinced themselves that they had, through financial instruments, made all that safe. That they. Yeah, 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 no, I, I, there's, what I'm saying when I'm saying it's not a morality play is if you treat it as a morality play and just say, well, those people should just suffer, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you might be the one, even though you didn't get the subprime mortgage, right, you may be the one losing a job. That's what I'm saying. learn from that? I mean, why would you keep repeating those kind of mistakes? Why would the government keep repeating those kind of mistakes? Why are they not learning from these bad decisions that have been made over you know, a hundred years? And, you know, okay, we've got to stop these policies. We've got to change our policies. <laughs> <laughs> because, because the government is politicians that yeah. like to get reelected, and so they like to just give out the goodies. Right, and same with the financial, the financial yeah. sector, right? There's this financial crisis after financial crisis after that. Minsky moment after Minsky moment keeps happening. And so the only, the only way to, to try to prevent that is, that's, is apparently regulation, because if you just leave it to the banks, they'll, they'll forget what just happened two, three years ago. And right now, I don't see any, they're, they're happily on their way to the next financial crisis. In terms of uh, Sally, Best Bob, and what's Japan? Japan, that's a, that's a part that I couldn't really fit in my little story. Um, 
Japan has done the gusting. It, it, it did a bit of government, uh, of government stimulus. But then every time the economy just started going a little bit, the central bank in Japan started raising interest rates. And that's the story I can't have in there, right? That when, you, when you raise interest rates, you actually put the brakes on the economy. And that's what Japan has been doing. Stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. A little, a short time in the 90s, they, they really got the economy going with a big government stimulus. And a year later, the, the central bank went, oh, okay, so we can raise interest rates again. And down it went again. And then the other aspect is, is the, the population in Japan is, is, very, is graying very rapidly. If you, if you, there's actually just today, I think, or yesterday, um, a graph in the, in the New York Times showing that if you look at how the economy in Japan has been doing for people between 15 and 65, the working age population is actually doing very well. A large part of why it looks flat is because the, the population is aging so fast. What about the, how does the Gus pay off his cab when he has the ability to print off Monopoly money for himself as opposed to manufacturing or bringing it in? He could do that. He could do that. And in fact, many governments have done that in the past, right? But it's a bad idea because as soon as you start doing that, right, there gets to be the expectation, oh, well, we can just spend on anything and we'll just print money. And before you know it, there'll be more money floating around than goods being produced, and that gives you inflation. So it's not smart for the government to try and pay off tabs with, with printed money. But it, it's always something, as long as you have your own currency, that's a big problem in Europe right now. The, the countries there don't have their own currency, right? They, they don't have any decisions over their monetary policy or printing money, and so they're kind of stuck but in, in the US, we just don't do it because it's a bad idea in the long run to try and solve your problems that way. It's better to just borrow from your own citizens and pay them back once you, the economy's back up again. I thought we were doing that. No, we're not. No, we're not printing money. Was that the idea behind the trillion dollar coin? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that's a very interesting story that so, so Congress passes all these laws, these spending decisions, right? And then later on has to decide whether we are, uh, the government can actually raise enough debt, right, from Sally to pay for all the things that they decided they were gonna buy. And then it turns around and says, oh no, no, we can't do that. We just voted to do it, but we, no, no, we can't do it. And that, got, that get, can get the government into deep trouble in terms of repaying its, its obligations and losing the trust of whoever lends money to it. And so then the, the trillion dollar coin was some sort of obscure legal rule that says, oh, you can get around the debt ceiling if you, because there's this little rule that says as long as it's platinum, <laughs> you don't have to have Congress's permission. You can, uh, you can um, create that money anyway. In the last recent history, 50, 60 years, our, our economy's gone through a series of you know, um, recessions and stuff like that. And in your, mo in your play model, you know, the government increases spending, but then eventually they cut back on their spending, right? So could you comment on the history of, has, has, our, has our government ever really cut back on spending to help balance their budget? The, in the Clinton years. The Clinton years were, were where we had a surplus for a couple of years, and that was because government spending went down quite a bit and taxes were raised, and so the deficit was cut quite a bit to, to the point where we had a surplus for a few years. The, um, and that was the, that's the only, expen only example I know, except I think one year back in the Nixon years, there was also a surplus. The, that's another thing that I can't capture in my little baby model, right, the, or, or play model. It actually is okay to run a deficit year after year after year. And I think in the history of the Republic, we've only had two or three years, 200 years, almost 200 years ago, where we actually didn't have a big government debt. But it's okay to have a government debt and to run a deficit as long as your deficit is, is about as big as your annual growth. So you can have about a three to 4% deficit is fine as long as your economy is growing at three to 4% a year. Because you can think of it as basically you're paying off last year's debt by this year's, with this year's growth. And that's been going on with ups and downs over the entire history. In fact, the, the that's another aspect. Now, I've got some graphs. I can actually show you, and that might actually be helpful. Let me, I, I did bring some graphs just in case there were questions about this. So here's a, here's a nice example. This is what happened to British 
debt. After 1812, they had debt as a percent of GDP, 250%. We're, we're right now at 70%, so not even close. <coughs> Just by growing, not by running budget surpluses, they ran deficits for the entire history of, of the British um, kingdom as well. Just by growing, they reduced their debt. So that's another thing. Just if you grow fast enough, your debt becomes a smaller and smaller and smaller problem. Same happened after the World War. And in fact, I think this, the same happened in the US. I just don't know if I can quickly get there. Where did I have it? <coughs> oh, look, so here you can see this is the lower graph is tax revenues. The upper graph is expenditure by the government. So this is, this is the Reagan years, right? We're running fairly big deficits, but comparable to growth. So the, the debt did run up. This is the Clinton years when expenditure went down quite a bit, tax revenues went up, and so we had a surplus for a short time. Then we had the Bush years, and this is the great recession that we're in right now. The, the Congressional Budget Office is predicting, this is from the latest report just from a few days ago, that this will come down because once the economy comes back up in a couple of years, right, tax revenues will go up, and expenditure on things like unemployment will come down, and then our deficit will be back to the normal, manageable level that we had, for example, during the Reagan years. Oh, here, this is the picture. So we had a debt that was more than 100% of our GDP after World War II, and we just grew our way out. We never had a surplus during these years, but we just grew our way out of the problem. So if you just get the, the economy back to growing again, the debt kind of takes care of itself as long as you run a deficit that's not bigger than your annual growth. So how would you fix Greece right now? Greece is just a completely different problem. Because it, it, like I said, it's, Greece is kind of like Ohio State or Florida, right? It, it doesn't have its own currency. The only way that it can dig itself out of its debt problem is by cutting back, right? And it, it just has to go back to crazy levels where, in fact, it's in a vicious cycle right now. The more it cuts back, the lower its tax revenues, and therefore the bigger its deficit becomes. And that's been going on for years now. And the same is happening in, in Spain, the same is happening in Ireland, and all these countries that don't have their own currency. We, do, we have our own currency, and that's a really important thing to have. What, what the Eurozone has been doing is the austerity thing. The exact wrong thing, right? We're in, we're in trouble, and so we're going to cut back because we think that we're a household. And so the, here's a graph comparing the US, right? We're back now above where we were at the beginning of the recession because we did have the stimulus. The Eurozone is going back into a second recession because it just keeps holding back and going, oh, no, no, we need austerity. It doesn't. It's not listening to its economy. And so that's what's happening in the Eurozone. So here's Britain. Britain does have its own currency, and it is doing the austerity thing. And it's now looking to go get into its third recession. Whereas the US, this is a 2011, the US is back above where it was before because it, it realized we need a stimulus. Germany's somewhere in between. A little bit, but the U.S. is just so big that exports and imports really don't drive our economy. It, it is us consumers that drive our economy. It, if you're a country like where I'm originally from, Holland, exports and imports there are, are I don't know, 50% 50, 50 of the economy. So then you're very much affected by what's going on around you. We, we're still such a big country with such a small fraction of exports and imports that it doesn't really matter. A little bit, but the, the exports aren't going to get us out of our slump. Reductions in exports don't drive our slumps. We bought ourselves out with the stimulus and dropped down in 09, but we're right back up. Why? Because we did get the economy going again, but um, the stimulus was, was was way too small. That's why we're we're we, we're still not back as fast as we could have been had we made up for the enormous um, drop in consumer expenditure. Basically, the stimulus was a, a drop in the bucket. 
and was largely upset by the fact that that state governments can't do that thing, but the, the, the Gus thing, right? They have to run balanced budgets. And so even though the federal government spent a little bit more, state governments more than made up for that by cutting, right? And, and firing teachers and, and so we've, we've added a little bit of stimulus and that's helped, but not nearly as much as we really should have had. So in the front, yeah. It seems to me that, we, that uh, this boils down to part of our problem is not accepting this conventional economic analysis is, is that is a crisis in confidence in our own government. If we understand the thrift paradox, the government, rather than individuals, is a, is a more efficient spender and more likely to stimulate the economy than individuals might say. But we have this enormous crisis of confidence in our government to do anything. Right, right. And much less spend all this money. I think that isn't that kind of at the heart of the, the problem? And how, how do you change? How do we get out of that? How do, how do we, how do we uh, get beyond this, this crisis? Of I don't have any special insight, because that's politics, right? <laughs> and be careful, right? When I say, when you say the government is more efficient at spending, I'm not saying we should leave all spending to the government, right? The, the government is very inefficient in a lot of respects, and that's part of the, the story, too. Right? The, but I'm just, in a recession, the government is the, is the spender of last resort, is, is kind of the way of thinking about it, because consumers aren't spending, businesses aren't spending, we're not gonna export our way out of, the government is the spender of last resort. But yeah, what, what your real question is about is about politics, I, I, and I have some special <laughs> insight there. They intersect, but try to keep them separate. <laughs> is it, isn't it better for the government to spend on highways and sewers and infrastructure than on entitlements? But again, entitlements are just a, a separate circular flow, right? It's okay. money it's money that we all put in the bank and we happen to do it with the government rather than a private firm and we get it back. It's an insurance company. The government is an insurance company and the government spends on highways and roads and bridges. And it's the spending on highways and roads and bridges that's gonna get us out of a recession. I think we'll bring this session to a close. Remember, we are going to have a roundtable discussion over lunch where we can continue uh, talking to class and, and pushing these issues. If you all come back to the next Saturday University in Sheridan, we'll bring a political scientist in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finishes. Thank you very much, class.